Hello everyone. So in this video, <clears throat> we'll talk about Xenophanes's fragments on the divine, on divinity, so the, the theological fragments. And um, we'll talk about both his um, critical theology, his sort of what is, what Guthrie I think calls uh, destructive criticism. So the theological critique that he offers for traditional sort of uh, traditional religion and uh, about constructive theology, you know, the kind of um, positive uh, theology and suggestions and, and ideas about, um, you know, um, God and divinity that he offers in, in these fragments. So, uh, first, the theological critique. So, his the theological critique, you know, in sum, is a sort of critique of anthropomorphic gods and an attack on traditional religion. So I'll read out a few of these fragments, and you'll, you'll see, you know, right with the fragments that we have, what kind of critique does he offer. So, <clears throat> fragment 11, he says, Homer and Hesiod attribute all things to gods that amongst humans are reproaches and flaws, thieving or stealing, adultery, and deception of each other, deceiving each other, mutual deception. Right? Uh, fragment 12 um, sort of repeats the same sort of idea. So they, th so, <clears throat> so they sing the many lawless deeds of gods, uh, stealing, again, adultery, and deception of each other. So this, this last line is the same. Last line is the same between uh, fragment 11 and 12. And so you see, you know, the kind of critique he's offering that, uh, I mean, what does he not like about the gods of Homer and Hesiod? that, um, you know, even amongst humans, these things would be counted as morally wrong, you know, these things would be co counted as reproaches, as flaws, um, what are thieving and adultery, you know, like stealing things, you know, committing adultery and deceiving each other. No, these things are not considered sort of morally good amongst humans, and Homer and Hesiod attribute these to gods. So, presumably, and we'll see with the constructive theology, you know, like, gods then need to be morally above reproach. Um, and here, these, uh, you know, these gods of Homer and Hesiod, we can definitely sort of reproach, and we, we see all these flaws in them. So, uh, as you can see, you know, this is, this is a very sharp attack on traditional religion. The other one that we already read in the previous video, fragment one, the last, last lines, uh, lines 21 to 23, which was, give us, no fi give us no fights with titans, no nor giants, nor centaurs, which our fathers falsely told, nor civil brawls in which there is no profit. Yeah? Again, there's this idea of, um, the, because this is what you would find in Iliad and Odyssey. It is all about violent conflict and about conflict between the gods as well. And um, again, a lot of stealing, adultery, deceiving each other. You know, lots of fights between the ti titans, giants, now that you have in, you know, Hesiod, Theogony. Um, so uh, there is no profit in that, he says, right? There is no profit, and um, he says it is good to have high regard for the gods. That's the last line, line 24. So, so uh, if, the, if you have gods whom you can't even respect, you know, whom you don't even think of as being morally good, you cannot have high regard for these gods. So why would you, you know, have such gods as are sort of discussed in uh, Homer and Hesiod? So, um, now... For us, it's a strange critique because think about it. For us, the Iliad and the Odyssey are literary texts, right? They are works of literature, which means they are, they are, they are sort of you know these brilliant works of literature where you know we we have these entertaining stories. Firstly, then we also have these literary and historical treasures. We are very lucky to have them, um, and we see them not as you know telling us how to live our lives. We don't see them as, we don't look towards Iliad and Odyssey for moral guidance, you know. Um, but in Xenophanes' time, um, these epics 
<clears throat> had a didactic function. They also had a religious function, as we already talked about, they all, in the sense that you know which gods to pray for, which gods to uh, look towards. Um, but the religious function is, a, is, is another thing where we already talked about how in the same way as one appeals to, uh, to the ones more powerful, you know, to the kings and chiefs, you know, the, we also appeal to the gods as, you know, even bigger kings and chiefs and immortal, moreover, right? So the religious part of it is a separate issue, but there's also the question of ethics and morality, which is being brought here, where if these people, if these people, I'm saying, um, slip of the tongue, if these gods, right, are um, so sort of morally corrupt in some ways, you know, that, that they have these characteristics which we would not even want, you know, our human sort of examples to have. How can they, how can they be examples for good behavior? How can they be examples for, for humans, right? So this didactic function of the Iliad and Odyssey was a very important thing in, um, in Xenophanes' time. And uh, this is what he's criticizing. So when he says that, you know, you know Homer and Hesiod, they, they, they sort of attribute all kinds of bad things to gods and they say that they, they steal, they cheat, they you know, deceive, they do all these things. And, um, and then they tell us about constant fights between the gods, constant fight, fights between these beings. What, what profit is there in that, you know? Um, if you have to have gods, then you should have high regard for them, you know, and, and they should be beings for whom you can have high regard. So that's, um, that's one of the critiques that we have, you know, like one, one of the very incisive critiques. In fragment 10, where he says, for all men, for, <clears throat> sorry, what all men learn is shaped by Homer from the beginning, right? And, that, and he explains exactly, this fragment is a great one, because he explains, you know, that, um, what we learn, you know, what we, what the, the education that we have, the education we are brought up with, is, is shaped by Homer from the very beginning. So you have, you know, this, this sort of, you know, Xenophanes' critique at this level is of Homer and Hesiod, is that, you know, the gods are immoral. So you saw in fragment 11 and 12, the immorality of the gods. And then there is another critique, which we will see, you know, which is related to this one, is the is the fact that they have human forms, you know, the, uh, the fact that they, have an, an, they are anthropomorphic. And this is less of a critique of morality. Well, with morality, we already have this idea of anthropomorphic. But um, it's more of, you know, then what form will, will they take? And here you will see, you know, the Xenophanes' traveler mind, the fact that he traveled so much, um, is where this critique comes from. So for example, fragment 14, and these are really brilliant fragments, I have to say. Fragment 14, where he says, it seems to mortal men that gods are begotten, uh, that means that they're born, that they come into being, um, and have their own clothes, voice, and bodily form, right? So, so the, the, uh, have their own, that means that of mortal men. So in this fragment, he's saying that, you know, what do humans think? The humans think that the gods are born, and then that these gods that are born, then, you know, dress like humans, ha speak like humans, look like humans, right? And like which humans like themselves, right? So if I imagine a god, I imagine a god that is like myself, you know, that looks like me, dresses like me, you know, um, they, they talks like me. So, so um, <laughs> this anthropomorphicity of the gods, that's one. And then, you know, the critique, which is the next fragment, fragment 15, which I think is really one of the most brilliant fragments, where he says, but if oxen and horses and lions had hands, or could draw and fashion their works like men, then horses would draw gods shaped like horses, oxen like oxen, and we presume lions like lions, making the bodies of the gods resemble their own forms. I mean, what a brilliant critique. Right? So basically what he's saying is that humans fashion gods according to their ideas of what, you know, like according to how they themselves look and sound and, you know, everything. So, so the fashioning of gods is done by humans. But if, let's say, oxen 
could draw, they would draw oxen god. If horses could draw, they would draw horse gods. And if um, lions could draw, they would draw lion gods. Yeah. So this this sort of you know this relativity of the gods, you know, from um, from the human imagination. So why do I draw a certain kind of god? Because, and, and also the fact that you know humans are drawing gods. This is the next step. You know, it's not just I. Okay. <clears throat> Here, there, there, you know, when it comes to, I don't think this is Xenophanes' own critique. This is me sort of projecting from it further. But um, this brilliant idea has been brought in that gods are creations of humans, not the other way around. Yeah, gods are creation of humans, and so he is putting into question all traditional sort of so-called knowledge of the gods, which we will see will come up. And fragment 16, which is the next one, which is again a brilliant fragment, where he says, Ethiopians say their gods are snub-nosed and dark, and Thracians say that they are blue-eyed and red-haired. Yeah? One more in the same line, because Ethiopians, let's say, who were presumably the ones who fashioned this god, were snub-nosed and dark. So for them, their gods were snub-nosed and dark. And Thracians, who presumably were blue-eyed and red-haired, obviously, I'm sure not all of them are of the same look. But let's say you know a lot of them were, or the ones in power were. Uh, and for them, then, the gods are red-haired and um, blue-eyed. Yeah. So. What he's bringing in is this discrepancy, these discrepancies between religious beliefs and the customs of people. Yeah, that uh, presumably gods created all humans and not just the Thracians. You know, the Thracian gods created Thracians, and the Ethiopians created Ethiopians, and you know, the Athenians created Athenians. You know, you don't you don't have this sort of like very specific gods creating specific people, right? So then. Why do we have so many different images, so many different pictures of these gods? So from um, Herodotus Histories, so this is a quote. If all humans were told to select the best nomoi from all that are, each people would upon consideration choose its own. There is a vast amount of evidence for this fact, including the following. When Darius was king of the Persian Empire, he summoned the Greeks who were at his court and asked how much money it would take for them to eat the corpses of their fathers. Oh. They responded that they would, they would not do it for any price. Afterwards, Darius summoned some Indians called Kalatiai, who do eat their parents. Okay, I don't know about these sort of strange Indian ancestors. And asked in the presence of the Greeks who understood through interpreters for what price they wouldn't agree to cremate their dead fathers, they cried out loudly and told him to keep still. That is what people's customs are, and I think Pinder was right when he wrote that nomos is the king of all. Nomos is law, or custom, custom, rather. <coughs> so <coughs> this, this passage is actually fairly brilliant, because uh, what, does it, what does it show us? What, what, does it, what does it talk about? Let's not take you know everything at face value because Herod Herodotus did have a habit of you know also inventing. St not it's not exactly in inventing stories, but a lot of it came from hearsay, and hearsay meant that <coughs> it's like Chinese whispers. You know, somebody said one thing and something else ended up with uh, Herodotus. So rather than look for you know the fact of what he's saying, look at the um, implication of what he's saying. What he's saying is that you know it is custom that dictates you know, you know, what is right and what is wrong um, in, in one culture or another. You know, there's this relativism of, of culture in that sense, that how can we say what is the right way of life? You know, how can we say what is the right thing to do? So it is custom that dictates it. So to go back, sorry, this small digression into, uh, into Herodotus. So to go back to um, Xenophanes, we again see that there is a slight discrepancy, you know, um, between this what he's po pointing out between this religious belief and customs of people, because the Greeks think that the gods have the appearance of Greeks, Ethiopians think they have the appearance of Ethiopians, Thracians that they have the uh, appearance of Thracians. So other people in other lands would portray their gods looking like themselves. So there's no reason really to prefer one account over others. Yeah. Uh, so what he's saying in, in you know, simpler terms is that 
th th these beliefs in you know what gods are like and what gods look like, um, th these beliefs stem from humans projecting their own nature onto the divine. Yeah, so humans are projecting the nature onto the divine, and that's where this belief is coming from. And so he's actually offering a critique of the idea that you know. Um, gods are of a single kind, like, you know, are of the kind that, for example, projected in Homer or, you know, in, in Hesiod. Because um, every, every single sort of culture, every single people come up with their own version of gods, yeah? And you could also have, you know, oxen with ox gods and lions with uh, lion gods and horses with horse gods. So then fragment 14, which, if you remember, was uh, there was also critique of um, the gods being born. Why? Because mortals, we are mortals, we are born, we die, right? So we also imagine the gods being born, an immortal, very strange, yeah? So he says that, you know, if they're immortal, then they should be eternal, which means that they can neither be born nor can they perish. There is no birth, there is no perishing. So, so the immortality of the gods sort of assumes that these gods cannot be born in the first place. You know, this is a particular idea of immortality that, and eternality that he's trying to bring forward. Um, there, are, there is evidence that he also criticized um, hierarchy amongst gods and um, they're the meddling in human affairs. So we have this from uh, Pseudo-Plutarch. So it's not a fragment. This is more of a testimony or or uh, from the doxographical tradition where he says, this is, uh, this is Pseudo-Plutarch who says, um, concerning the gods, he shows that there is no government amongst them, for it is impious that any of the gods should have a master and that none of them lacks anything in any respect, right? So this is another critique of the Homeric gods that why should you have one who is a master or even of the Hesiodic gods, both of them, you know, why do you have one master? Why do you have Zeus as master and everybody else, you know, as subordinate? And why do you have these hierarchies? You know, like gods being perfect beings, you know, if there is a plurality of them, and we'll see that, that later he'll criticize that as well, um, should not have any kind of hierarchy, any kind of government, any kind of, you know, again, this is probably humans projecting their um, you know human societies and the human the structures of human societies onto the gods so this is another sort of critique of you know divine hierarchy that we have so pretty incisive critique right so if you just look at the kind of critique that we have we have a critique of the immoral immorality of traditional gods you know the fact that they deceive they steal they do all kinds of things right uh, of um, this kind of battle amongst gods, you know, like that, that there, there's, there's so much struggle between them, you know, that there are these battles between giants and titans and all these things, uh, that they look like any particular humans, you know, that they have human forms even. So, so the anthropomorphicity of gods, there's a critique of that. Uh, and then finally, if you believe this testimonia, there's also a critique of hierarchy amongst gods, of power relations amongst gods. So that's what we have uh, from Xenophanes on um, what is called destructive criticism or basically a kind of critique of uh, traditional religion. We then also have um, a sort of constructive theology that we can construct from his works. And uh, I did say that I was going to talk about both in this video, but actually let me do that in the next video because this one has gone long enough. And so in the next video, I'll talk about the constructive theology that uh, Xenophanes offers um, and um, the idea of uh, the divine being that he brings forth. Okay, thank you. <laughs>